So in the wake of Dr. Billy Graham's passing, I thought it would be great to chat to you a little bit about what we can learn from Billy Graham, especially as the younger generation. Um, for instance, I, I've, I've heard about Billy Graham, I know of his legacy, I know people who were saved through his campaigns um, and people who were associated with his campaigns, but on, on a personal level for me, I, I don't necessarily know him, I haven't heard him speak. Um, so what the question really is, what can a younger generation learn from Billy Graham? That's a good question, Paul. I think the first thing I'd say is that it's, it's just great to be actually having a conversation on what can we learn from someone who's that much older. Um, and I think that's great. I think that we have got a lot to learn from one another. I mean, when Billy Graham first came to the UK and had the big campaign at Haringey, um, I, I was at primary school, so, so the age gap was quite big for me. So it was yeah. like learning from someone who's a whole lot older. I think the first thing that really struck me was uh, it was amazing to me as a relatively small kid, you know, six, seven, that um, here was someone who'd come from America and yet was able to engage well with the British public at a time when, you know, there were tensions. And he seemed to have that ability to relate to the huge crowds that gathered at Haringey, but also we were aware that he could talk to politicians, he could talk on the media, he could even relate to the royal family, and that just seemed incredible that here was someone, he seemed very remote, I must admit, you know, mm. because I was small and he was up there, and I just couldn't imagine how someone could have that kind of influence and impact. But there was a sense even then of, of a huge amount of respect and curiosity. And I suppose that ability that he had to engage that widely is definitely something that's worth looking at even generations later. As, as a young person, as a kid in primary school then, how did that impact you over the next few years as you were, you know, going further into Oh, right. Well, as I, as I came into my teens, I mean, one of the things that was very common in youth groups in those days, church youth groups, was to show the Billy Graham films. And they were fascinating because you used to use these old projectors where you had to loop it all in and we never managed to sync it right. So we all thought Billy Graham was amazing because he could move his lips at one speed and <laughs> speak a completely different way. But we grew up on those Billy Graham films and, and the stories were quite amazing of people who'd been converted at the Billy Graham campaigns and then you'd get some of Billy Graham's preaching and you'd get how it all followed through. So we grew up with some of that. So that sort of enhanced that, that feeling. There's someone here who's really communicating the gospel and having a big impact. So moving on from that, I mean, by the time I was a student, Billy Graham was actually back holding campaigns at Earl's Court in the right. 60s. So I, I was at that, I uh, was at Earl's Court, I took friends there, and then the following year when he was back again, we had those in the regions as well. So I was actually one of the councillors in, I suppose I was still in my teens, or maybe just coming into my 20s, um, when uh, we had a, a live link relay in, in Brighton. So that was my first experience of actually being engaged yeah. in a Billy Graham campaign yeah. and to be there night after night and to see how he presented the gospel. You, you later on got some uh, oh, one-on-one well, yeah, time. You've gone from that because I suppose really when I was in late teens, early 20s and as a counsellor at uh, in the Billy Graham campaign in the 60s, I had no idea, you know, that sort of 20 plus years later, I'd actually be heading up all the counselling and follow up for Mission 89, which was the last major campaign that Billy Graham did uh, in the United Kingdom. And that was an interesting time for me because um, I did actually get some one-to-one -one time with him. And that was a huge, huge privilege, probably one of the biggest privileges of my life, really, to have that one-to-one uh, -one opportunity with him. And before I, I, I spent time with him, his staff said to me, you're going to have a surprise because he's not what you might think. You, you, he's not that distant. He's not that aloof. He'll ask you questions that you never thought he'd ask you. He'll want to engage with you. And don't be surprised if it comes across in a way that you never expected. And, and it really was a bit unexpected. What, to what be honest. was he like? Well, um, very engaging. Uh, he, was, he was prepared to talk about anything. There was one occasion when I was with him and uh, <coughs> his colleague um, uh, Cliff Barrows and, and T. Wilson was all there. And we were just talking and he would actually talk and ask questions. He, he sort of saw me, I suppose by that time I was 42, something like that. So I was already an established church leader. But he saw me as someone who he could get sort of local knowledge from. Mm -hmm. So he talked to me about anything. I remember on one occasion he said, um, Hugh, how should I address Princess Alexandra? So I started telling him, you know, you say your Royal Highness and then ma'am. 
He said, I've always called it Alex. I just said, well, just carry on, you know. <laughs> and, and so I'd have those kind of conversations where I just couldn't believe he was asking me those questions. Sometimes he'd ask me how he, I felt the service had gone. Um, I remember one big discussion he was having about, um, just in that small group of us, about three or four of us, when he was saying that he was very aware that some people, perhaps a more Pentecostal background, would question things like the fact that there wasn't a big healing emphasis or something like that in his ministry. And some people would talk about, you know, the anointing and the movement of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, he asked me quite directly, you know, did I, did I feel that sort of, was I aware that the Spirit of God was moving in the meetings? And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is a big question. Um, but I remember just sitting on the platform behind him, because um, we had four venues in Mission 89, uh, West Ham and then uh, Crystal Palace and Earl's Court and then Wembley. And sitting on the platform behind him in those different venues, I was just aware that when he, when he did the appeal and he reached the point where he said, I want you to get up out of your seat and commit your life to Christ. He, he had that confidence of faith mm. that people were going to respond. And so he wasn't like a lot of people when they do the appeal, they keep pushing the point and saying, um, now, come on, I need someone to respond. What about you? What about you? He would just stand there like this, having given the appeal, and just wait. And we decided in London that we weren't going to use the music in 89. So it was, it was silence. But the silence of chairs tipping back and people stepping forward and the footfall across the audience. In the huge spaces. In the huge yeah. space. It was just like, it, you really felt the power of God. It was yeah. just absolutely incredible. And, you know, just the, uh, on one occasion when we were using multi-screens, I was asked if um, we would supply evangelists to do the appeal in the other areas. And I just thought, you can't actually take away from a Billy Graham mm -hmm. appeal. There's something of just about the way he stands there in faith, not pushing the point, but just trusting God for that response. There seems to be something really quite special about, even when you hear about it, those appeals where thousands would just come forward. But you've spoken about this side of, of uh, Billy Graham that his um, uh, assistant said you might be surprised when you meet him in person about yeah. his, uh, and I've heard you speak about his humility and his integrity. Do you think there's, there's some sort of link on why he was so successful in his campaigns because of what he was like behind yeah, I'm absolutely sure of that. And I think that if that's one thing perhaps we could convey to someone like yourself as a, a, a younger person uh, and say there's something about having a life that matches your ministry mm. that is really important. And, and that humility w was quite, quite genuine. I mean, I've, I've got all sorts of crazy stories. I mean, there was a occasion, it's actually my wife's 40th birthday. It was a Sunday, we'd gone round to my in-laws. And uh, we left my, uh, my older son at home. He was studying for exams at the time. And he said, Dad, you've got to come home. Billy Graham keeps ringing me up. And so when I, when I get home, um, he rang again, inevitably, and said, Hugh, I just wanted to tell you, I just had lunch with the Queen. And I, I told her about it. And I was thinking, how on earth does he think <laughs> that telling the Queen about me? But that was the kind of person he was. There was no... There was no distinction. I was just a young 42-year-old minister. But he would talk to me as if I was someone that really mattered. Oh, it's been incredibly empowering coming I, from it was, it was, a senior leader, you yeah. know, in terms of sowing into a younger generation. You know, I, I look back now and I, I'm just startled that, yeah. you know, he would, he would talk like that and be prepared to open up about, you know, my next campaign is going to be so-and-so. You know, I've been asked if I pray for the sick there. What do you think, Hugh? And I was thinking, is he, is, I don't mind now looking back whether he really wanted my opinion or not. I mean, he might not have needed my, I'm sure he didn't need my opinion. But the fact that he was prepared to involve me yeah. in that kind of way and have those kind of conversations with me were, 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 were stunning, really. I just think, how on earth did that happen? Mm. And it was just so, so gracious of him. And... People used to say to me, why do so many people respond like that? You know, we had, I mean, Crystal Palace, there was an attendance of 33,000. So the response was about 3,000 people. We get a 10% response. So as many people as responded on the day of Pentecost were coming forward. Yeah. 
each night at Crystal Palace. And they'd say, well, how does it happen? And I, it's obviously there was a faithful proclamation of the word and he kept it simple. Okay, he has a style which is very different from mine. I mean, one of the things I made sure of that, you know, having had that opportunity, I didn't want to become a little carbon copy Billy Graham. And his preaching style, he, he uses a lot of balancing phrases, like he might say, the world says this, but the Bible says this. So you get that kind of contrast. So it was a distinctive preaching style, but I know it wasn't the style that brought people forward. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it was the impact of the word of God and the simplicity of saying you've keep it straight, keep it online, you've got to make a commitment to Christ. But there was something about the integrity. It was like, if this man says that I need to make a commitment to Christ, then I definitely do need to make a commitment to Christ. I believe him. Believe him, I believe him. And, and one of the things we need to take hold of is that if you want to learn from Billy Graham, you can't fake integrity. Mm. You know, there are some people who try, you know, door-to-door -door salesman might try to convince you he's got the best product in the world, but... <coughs> There was something about Billy Graham that you knew he wasn't trying. He was absolutely convinced and he was sharing it from that conviction without any sense of personal benefit. I mean, he never, ever pushed the whole personal prosperity agenda. He, he would take the same salary as a pastor of a large church in the States. He wanted to see the ministry grow. So there were so many, many, many things that just spoke of his integrity. But then that integrity itself would speak when he came to ask people to make a commitment to Christ. And you also spoke about his faith being so tremendous and just being able to stand there. I just, th there seems to be this <laughs> three aspects of him that, you know, on, on the platform, speaking to the people behind the doors and just spiritually his faith of, of knowing that he is speaking truth and that if he calls, people will respond. And that faith wasn't the kind of faith that some people talk about where I'm building up my faith muscles. It's all about my faith. It was actually about just his simple trust in God. This was like, yeah, it, it, it's not about my preaching. It's about God turning up and touching people's hearts. Yeah. And that confidence that if you preach the word, then God would be the one that touched people's lives and the Holy Spirit would move in the situation and that would bring it. So it was, it was completely devoid. I mean, some people say, oh, there was a big build-up, you know, there was a big choir, there was a big this, there was a big that. George Beverly Shea would sing, and uh, how great thou art, and the amazing bottom note that he'd get, and then Billy Graham would preach. But it wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. It wasn't to do with the build-up or the style. Some of those things, yes, for a preacher, they make you feel comfortable. I know for me that if certain things are there, it just makes me feel comfortable and makes it easier for me. But he was equally at home in, in other environments. I, I, I had a challenge just at a personal level as the person responsible for uh, follow-up in the East End of London that I hadn't got enough participating churches and we were really committed to making sure that people were supported in a local church environment. And so we were coming to the point where people needed to do discovery groups, those who'd been forward at the campaign. and. I just hadn't got enough people to run the discovery groups, not enough churches to go into. So I, I, I thought it would be great if Billy Graham recorded the discovery group material. So if you couldn't actually get to a discovery group, at least you'd got a video of Billy Graham teaching the content. And his staff were convinced he would never do it. You know, they said, Hugh, you're not going to get this one. You know, it doesn't work. But he very graciously agreed. And, and he just taught that material to camera. I mean, it was quite amusing because people in Stratford were hearing how Billy Graham had learnt to read his Bible with it propped up on a bucket as he milked a cow, which is how he, <laughs> how he said that he, as a young man he'd started his Bible reading. And I thought, that's going to be very interesting in Stratford if people think they've got to find a bucket and a cow. <laughs> in but it was, the, it was the naturalness with which he communicated, which I thought was absolutely amazing. So there's, I think there's a whole heap of things to take from Billy Graham. I mean, one thing I, I certainly see in you that you've taken from him is your willingness to listen to the younger generation, listen to people who are not as senior as you. I, I know you're always asking opinions and, you know, <laughs> local information about, about things that you might not have a direct access to. I mean, that's what I see a lot in you. So what, what would you say are the biggest takeaways that you've taken away from? Oh, okay. I'd say number one, integrity. Um, humility. Uh, I, I, I wish I could 
match that, I just think, you, but you can't, the more humble you try to be, the more arrogant you get. I'm very arrogant about my humility. Uh, it just doesn't work, does it? And his, his desire to be culturally relevant. I'm sure a lot of those questions he asked me were because I want to get this right. I'm an American in Britain. And I think that's something that we need to take with us. I mean, I travel a lot around the world these days, and I certainly don't go into a place saying I'm here to to tell you from my point of view, I want to find out where people are at. And I think that's something that I really appreciated about the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, that they were prepared to, to come and, and learn and seek to be culturally relevant so there were no unnecessary barriers in the way of responding to the gospel. Relational, yeah, I, 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 perhaps I was just privileged just to be in the right place at the right time. But certainly he was very relational. And that ability to, um, not have this kind of sense of how important I am because I talk to this person or that person. I mean, the funny side of the story about him ringing me up and saying he mentioned to the Queen to me was his naivety in thinking that we all just had that kind of relationship with the Queen <laughs> because he, he didn't have that um, sense of self-aggrandizement that some people would have. It wasn't boasting material for him. He didn't, didn't need any of that. He was just confident in who he was in Christ and if we can cultivate that in our lives whatever generation we're in that's going to be amazing. So it seems he wasn't really pushing his own agenda he was pushing God's. Absolutely that sums it up really well. Well thanks you.